Hi everybody and welcome to today's video which is part of my Poets Corner series and today we're going to be looking at a poem called Jessie Cameron by the Victorian poet Christina Rossetti. And as we're looking at this poem we're going to be applying a little bit of literary theory because theory helps us to unlock new ideas in a text and we're going to be looking at feminism today. I'm not going to talk too much about this because I have in plenty of other videos. Um, so if you're not sure what feminism is, search for my video about feminism, watch that first and then come back here. So Christina Rossetti, as I've said, was writing during the Victorian period. And before we read and understand the poem, we really need to know what the historical context of that was. And we talk about the Victorian period as being a patriarchal society, so a society in which men were dominant and women were submissive and subservient. And we often use the phrase separate spheres to talk about that. And the idea here is that the women occupied this, the domestic sphere, so they were responsible for the housekeeping and for the bringing up of children. They didn't really have any um, intellectual responsibilities. Certainly, they didn't have a great level of education. And if you were an upper class woman, this meant that you might direct your servants to complete uh, domestic tasks for you. You know, what to cook for dinner, what to clean, etc., what to do with the children. If you were a middle class woman, you might do some of those tasks yourself, but you might also have a little bit of help from servants. And if you were a working class woman, then the likelihood is you'd be going out to your factory or to work on the farm as well as completing these domestic tasks. And while the women are doing that, the men in their separate sphere are completing tasks that have to do with business, with finance, with the law. Um, and the Victorians were very worried that those kind of activities could tarnish somebody's morality. So it was essential for the woman to remain morally perfect and at home she would be protected from these kind of evil outside influences. When the man returned home from his day at work, when he possibly had this tarnished morality from his kind of day wrangling over business, um, she would restore his kind of sense of stealth and restore that idea of um, family harmony and so on. So it's essential that the woman remained what was called the angel in the house, that she was um, innocent, perfect, um, completely shielded from what was going on in the real world. Now, we also talk here about a lack of female agency. So agency meaning the ability to make independent decisions, choices for yourself. As well as that, we have the phrase political disenfranchisement. So this means um, primarily that you don't have the vote or you don't have a voice in the political world. And if you think about everything that the suffragettes did to get the vote for women in Britain, you know, this was all about women not being able to do basic things. So, for example, divorce a husband um, who was abusive to them, you know, and in order to get that through law, women had to get themselves a voice um, by gaining the vote. So that all kind of links together. Then we have stereotypes of women, which I'm sure you're very familiar with from all of the literature that you've ever studied. Um, but this is about women being apparently naturally caring and compassionate, motherly, maternal, um, but also that they were physically weaker than men, that intellectually they were weaker than men and so on. And all of these stereotypes, which we'll talk about in a minute, were justified using biblical texts. Um, in the Bible, there's this story of creation um, in the book of Genesis in the Garden of Eden. And the idea is that Adam, man, was created first and he was stronger and he asked God for a companion. And so God took one of Adam's ribs and used that as the foundation for women. And women were therefore kind of weaker. You know, they were seen to be a kind of lesser kind of man. And those biblical texts were almost used to justify stereotypes of women and the fact that it should be men who should be dominant and in charge. And then all of this comes together in this idea of the silencing of women's voices. So if women are intellectually weaker, then, of course, men need to look after them. You know, we've got this um, idea about benign paternalism, where men are just being very kind and looking after women because they're not able to do it themselves. 
And what a lot of female writers and feminist writers try to do is to break free from these stereotypes and to say, actually, women do need a voice. They do have a voice and they are as intellectually and physically equal to any man. And this comes into the idea of the literary canon as well. And I've done a separate video on the literary canon, which you can check out if you want to. But I'll summarise it here. So the canon is a list or an idea of the texts that we should study at school and at university and in society in general. So if I ask someone to name a British writer, they would probably say William Shakespeare. And they might say Charles Dickens. Other people that come to mind that we study in school a lot, J.B. Priestley, uh, William Wordsworth, William Blake, John Keats, um, Seamus Heaney. But the important thing about all of these names that I've just mentioned is that they're all dead white men. And that's really limiting in terms of the literary canon, because then all we are reading about is men's experiences. And what female writers wanted to do was articulate the female experience of the world and to challenge the preconceptions and the stereotypes of women that are right there. And that's one of the things that Christina Rossetti was trying to do in her poetry. So before we move into look at the poem, I just want to show you this critical comment. It's really important that if you're doing A-level literature, you're doing your own research and you're reading things up online, ask your teacher for guidance about this, about the particular text that you're doing. But this quotation is taken from a critic called Simon Avery. I've got this from the British Library website, which is a fabulous resource. And Avery says that Christina Rossetti at times used the biblical idea of woman's subordination to man as a reason for maintaining the status quo. Rossetti was deeply religious and this idea that sometimes the Bible is used to back up that women are subordinate to men is quite clear in her poetry. But then Avery continues, whilst the others, she argued for female representation in Parliament and spoke out against the sexual exploitation of women in prostitution. Her views may not always be radical as such, but they are usually far from conservative and often questioning, challenging and potentially subversive. So Christina Rossetti is really interesting as a writer because you can't really describe her as feminist. However, there are feminist elements to her writing. And it's almost like she's torn between this traditional idea of what a woman should be and her intellectual knowledge of what women actually are. And that's one of the reasons why I find her poetry really fascinating. So today's poem, as I've said, Jessie Cameron, is about um, a young woman who's on the beach with a man who wants her to marry her. And she's constantly refusing this man. And eventually they stay on the beach so long that they are killed by the incoming tide. So let's have a read of it first. Jessie, Jessie Cameron, Hear me but this once, quoth he. Good luck go with you, neighbour's son, but I'm no mate for you, quoth she. Day was verging toward the night. There beside the moaning sea, dimness overtook the light. There where the breakers be. Oh, Jessie, Jessie Cameron, I have loved you long and true. Good luck go with you, neighbour's son, but I'm no mate for you. She was a careless, fearless girl and made her answer plain. I'd spoken she to earl or churl, kind-hearted in the main, but somewhat heedless with her tongue and apt at causing pain. A mirthful maid and she and young, most fair for bliss or bane. Oh, long ago I told you so, I tell you so today. Go you your way and let me go, just my own free way. The sea swept in with moan and foam, quickening the stretch of sand. They stood almost in sight of home, he strove to take her hand. Oh, can't you take your answer then, and won't you understand? For me, you're not the man of men. I've other plans are planned. You're, t you're good for Madge, or good for Sis, or good for Kate, maybe. But what's to me the good of this? Well, you're not good for me. They stood together on the beach, they two alone, and Lido waxed his urgent speech, his patience almost gone. Oh, say but one kind word to me, Jessie, Jessie Cameron. I'd be too proud to beg, quoth she, and pride was in her tone, and pride was in her lifted head and in her angry eye, and in her foot which might have fled, but would not fly. Some say that he had gypsy blood, that in his heart was guile, yet he had gone through fire and flood only to win her smile. Some say his grandam was a witch, a black witch from beyond the Nile, who kept an image in a niche and talked with it the while. 
and by her hut far down the lane some say they would not pass at night lest they should hear an unked strain or see an unked sight alas for jessie cameron the sea crept moaning moaning nigher she should have hastened to be gone the sea swept higher breaking by her she should have hastened to be to her home while yet the west was flushed with fire but now her feet are in the foam the sea foam sweeping higher oh mother linger at your door and light your lamp to make it plain but jessie she comes home no more no more again they stood together on the strand they only each by each home her home was close at hand utterly out of reach her mother in the chimney nook heard a startled seagull screech but never turned her head to look towards the darkening beach neighbours here and neighbours there heard one scream as if a bird shrilly screamed cleft in the air that was all they heard jessie she comes home no more comes home never her lover's step sounds at his door no more for ever and boats may search upon the sea and search along the river but none know where the bodies be sea winds that shiver sea birds that breast the blast sea waves swelling keep the secret first and last of their dwelling whether the tide so hemmed them round with its pitiless flow that when they would have gone they find no way to go whether she scorned him to the last with words flung to and fro or clung to him when hope was past none will ever know whether he helped or hindered her threw up his life or lost it well the troubled sea for all its stir finds no voice to tell only watchers by the dying have thought they heard one pray wordless urgent and replying one seemed to him to say him nay and watchers by the dead have heard a windy swell from miles away with sobs and screams but not a word distinct for them to say and watchers out at sea have caught glimpse of a pale gleam here or there come and gone as quick as thought which might be hand or hair okay there is so much to say about this poem but i'm just going to focus really closely on the representation of jessie as a as a woman in this poem but a quick summary first so in the first stanza um the male lover is asking her to be with him night's falling they're standing on the beach and she says no absolutely not the second stanza focuses on summarizing jesse's character and we'll go into that in a little bit the third stanza the sea's coming in they're still standing on the beach and she says look you're good for everyone else you might be good for madge you might be good for sis but you're not good for me so she's insisting that she makes her own choice in who she's going to marry so they in the fourth stanza they continue to stand on the beach they're alone and he continues to insist but she becomes quite proud and she says no i'm absolutely not going to marry you the fifth stanza is all about gossip and the kinds of things that other people say about him um, and the fact that possibly there's a supernatural element um, to his life. He's got some kind of gypsy blood. That's a little bit unclear. In the sixth stanza, we've got the sea coming in. Um, and then at the end of that sixth stanza, Jessie, she comes home no more, no more again. So she's perished at the seaside, at the beach. Then the next stanza, they've there's been some kind of scream that might have been heard from the village so we've got the startled seagull screech which obviously isn't the seagull that's something happening between jesse and her lover or the tide coming in and sweeping them away and then the final stanzas are speculating really on what might have happened so did she scorn him did she shout at him did she cling to him when they were being swept away did he help her? Did he try and save her? Or did he push her into the sea? Did he hinder her? So it's a little bit unclear what has actually happened. But the final stanza reminds us that these this couple have died and there's maybe an echo of their voices every so often on the wind. You can maybe hear them cry if you go and visit that beach. In terms of a feminist interpretation, the first thing that strikes me is the use of Jessie Cameron's name. And this is really asserting woman's individuality and identity. And if we contrast this with a poem like Robert Browning's Porphyria's Lover, um, we can see that actually in Porphyria's Lover, she's identified very much in connection with the man, even though she's given a name, her identity is all connected with the man that she's supposed to be in love with. 
Um, if we think about a poem like The Farmer's Bride by Charlotte Mew, um, she's not identified there, no name is given to her. But here in the title and in the first line of the poem, Christina Rossetti asserts Jessie's individual identity. And this is in complete contrast to the lack of identity to the, of the male character. And that's quite unusual. As well as this, um, it's really interesting that there's lots of references to liminal spaces in the poem. And by liminal, I mean things that are on the verge. They're changing, they're transitioning between one thing and another. So, for example, the beach that they're standing on is a liminal space because it's between the definite watery death of the sea and the safety of the land. And they're standing in this transitional space in between. In the same way, night is falling. So day has gone, night is falling, and they're standing in the twilight. Um, and these two images of twilight and of the beach setting are re reiterated throughout the poem. And this liminal space might symbolise the themes of social change. So we have a society which is transitioning from complete patriarchy, where men are dominant, to the possibility that women might be able to make their own decisions in things. So this liminal setting could possibly symbolise the, the moment of history that we're in here. As well as that, we could analyse the representation of Jesse, particularly in the second stanza. Now, if we look at this first line of the second stanza here, she was a careless, fearless girl and made her answer plain. There's something quite admiring in the narrator's tone here. Um, it says she's outspoken to Earl or Churl. So an Earl, obviously someone of upper class, a Churl, someone who's a bit annoying, someone who's getting in the way, probably of lower class. And so the idea here is that Jessie's integrity is the same no matter who she's talking to, no matter how much money they have. Um, this, the fourth line of the stanza says that she's kind hearted and so on. So there's quite an admiring tone in that first section. But then after that, we've got a note of caution here because it says that she's heedless. So someone who's heedless doesn't think through what they're doing. So she speaks too quickly. She doesn't think before she says things. And sometimes this causes pain. Sometimes she hurts people with what she says. Then it says that she's mirthful and she's young. So maybe she's lacking a little bit of sense, a little bit of knowledge about the world and so on. So going back to what um, Simon Avery said in the essay that we looked at at the start of this video, we've got this idea of Christina Rossetti being torn between this kind of biblical interpretation of femininity, that women should be subordinate to men and that they shouldn't be too outspoken, they shouldn't be heedless with their tongue. But on the other hand, we've got this sense of admiration for girls who are actually prepared to stand up for themselves and not be so submissive to the men in their lives. And so we could ask, is the narrator admiring or is she admonishing Jessie? And I'm not sure that I've got an answer for that. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about this poem is that it kind of sets out these questions, but really doesn't actually give us very many answers. But it gives us lots and lots to think about. The next thing I want us to look at is the idea of the sea, which is a motif all the way through the poem. Now, in literature, the sea often represents freedom. So if you read a book um, uh, by Kate Chopin, the name of the book, title of the book escapes me, or The Awakening by Kate Chopin, um, at the end of that, sorry to spoil the end of it, um, she swims out into the sea. And this is a real symbol of freedom, of her sexual awakening, of her seizing this idea of female agency, that she can make choices in her own life. And so sea could be an idea of freedom. Alternatively, it could be quite destructive. So if we think of a poem like Tennyson's The Sea, where the sea's crashing on the rocks, this is an articulation of Tennyson's deep sense of loss at the death of his uh, one of his very close friends. So the sea is quite an ambiguous symbol and nowhere more so than in this poem. If we look closely at what Rossetti writes, we have the moaning sea. Um, and later on, stanza three, the sea swept in with a moan. Stanza six, the sea crept moaning and so on. So this sea is personified and it could represent Jessie's psychological state, perhaps. It could represent the, the pain and suffering that she goes through as she's trapped by these um, patriarchal social structures. On the other hand, um, it could be society who's in pain 
the actions of people like Jesse and society trying to fight back almost. So interpret the sea how you will, but don't don't ignore it as a really important motif in the poem. So what we've got here is a poem that narrates the story of a young woman's rejection of society or of social conventions anyway. And her death seems to follow from this assertion of her independence. But how do we interpret this? I mean, Simon Avery pointed to two possible angles. And so we could ask ourselves, firstly, is the poem a cautionary tale? Is it warning young women not to challenge the status quo? Because if they do, they might end up dead. <laughs> or, you know, maybe not actually um, suffering Jessie's fate, but some kind of social death, which for the Victorians would be just as bad. Or does the poem lament the fact that women's increasing desire for freedom has not been matched by progress in society? So from a modern perspective, Jessie should have been able to say no to this man and then go home. You know, she's made the choice and then she's gone. But actually, she's trapped in this liminal transitional space where she says no, but she can't quite move herself from that situation. You know, despite her admirable resilience, her self-possession, she still perishes. And I think maybe the poem can be taken in both ways. You know, maybe we can interpret it using both of these ideas at the same time. It's lamenting the fact that society hasn't changed enough for women to be free. But at the same time, it's saying, if you are the one who stands out, if you are the one who's different to everyone else and seizes your freedom, then you better be brave enough to be able to take the consequences of that. So if you liked this poem, um, there's lots of other things in this kind of vein that you can read up on. And as I've said already, look at the British Library website. It's a wonderful resource with lots of essays and poems and um, original artefacts there as well. Um, you could look at Christina Rossetti's Goblin Market, which I absolutely love. It's a fabulous poem. You could also look at Alfred Law Tennyson. Um, he's got a couple of very well-known poems, The Lady of Shalott. Um, you may not recognise the title of that, but you'll probably know the story when you read the poem. Um, and Mariana in the Moated Grange. And both of those poems are ballads along the lines of the one that we've just read about women being entrapped and not having freedom. Um, you might be familiar with Elizabeth Barrett Browning's Sonnets from the Portuguese already. Certainly, if you did the Love and Relationships strand of the AQA um, Literature GCSE, you'll have read Sonnet 29 and studied that. And in that poem, um, Elizabeth Barrett Browning celebrates women's uh, freedom to articulate their own sexual passion. Um, so Sonnets from the Portuguese is a really good um, series to look at as well. So thank you very much for listening and make sure you check out the next video in the series.